Executives and everybody else knows about the new kinds of technologies that keep popping on the scene uh, all along as we go forward. But I think there's a key perspective that a lot of people in many cases don't really get yet, which is these new technologies are not just fancy technologies that let individual people do different things better or faster. These new technologies change the essence of organizations. An organization itself is really primarily a, a huge human-based machine for communicating information and making decisions. And these new technologies are all about communicating information and helping to make decisions. So to a greater degree than any technology since, for instance, those that enable the Industrial Revolution, we're now in the midst of a transformation in how businesses are organized that is enabled this time not by new kinds of production technology, but by new kinds of coordination technology. The question we think of as one of the core research questions for our Center for Collective Intelligence, how can people and computers be connected so that collectively they act more intelligently than any person, group, or computer has ever done before. If we take that question seriously, I think the answers we get will look very, very different from the kinds of organizations we've seen up till now. So people have been talking for at least a decade about how uh, we're going to be empowering more people, pushing more decisions down, etc. I think all that's true, to, uh, to certainly to a degree, but I think people don't yet realize how profound this change will be. The very word empowerment, which was kind of popular in the 90s, I don't, people don't use it as much anymore now, but I think a lot of people still think of things that way. The very word empowerment suggests that there's somebody up here who has the power who's going to give it to more people down here. What I think we're going to see more and more in business, as we have already seen, by the way, in the last couple of hundred years in government, is that more and more the power will start out here and some of it will be given to people at the top to, to help coordinate others. But I think we're likely to see these changes first in the places where the benefits are most important. The benefits of having lots of people make decentralized decisions for themselves are things like people are more highly motivated when they're deciding things for themselves. They work harder. They're also often more creative. They're willing to be more inventive to try out more things when they're doing their own thing. They're able to be more flexible when they can adapt what they do to the specific situation in which they find themselves, rather than having to follow rigid rules sent down from on high that may or may not apply in this particular situation. And finally, often, they just plain like it better. Now, those benefits of decentralized decision-making won't be important everywhere. In certain places, like say certain kinds of semiconductor manufacturing, the biggest uh, benefits of uh, biz biggest benefits come from things like economies of scale, and in those cases, I think we may well see cheap communication used to enable even more centralization to take advantage of more economies of scale. But, and here's a key point: in our increasingly knowledge-based and innovation-driven economy, the critical factors of business success are often precisely the same things as those benefits of decentralized decision-making. Freedom, flexibility, motivation, creativity, and so forth. So I think where we'll see the changes first is in the places where those benefits are most important. For instance, I think we'll see them especially in cases where having highly motivated workers is important, or where creativity is important. I think we'll see them in a lot of high-tech, R&D-oriented industries. 
I think we'll certainly see these changes early in lots of industries and functions where the essential work is information or knowledge work. Because there, what's changing is not just the technologies for coordinating the work, it's also the technologies for the actual production of the work. I think there are two kinds of questions to ask to think about how to apply these ideas in a particular organization. The first question kind of makes sense almost any time you're thinking about doing anything different, which is to think about what is it we're really doing here in the first place? What are our real goals? What are our key strategic uh, choices here? I teach an MBA course called Strategic Organizational Design, and one of the key points I make is that you can't really design an organization without either already knowing or concurrently thinking about what are your, what's your real strategy. So I think that's an important question to ask in any case. And if you want to take advantage of some of the new capabilities for the kinds of collective intelligence that we've talked about, you need to ask that question at a fairly detailed level. What are the specific actions we might hope to do in new ways because of collective intelligence? Are we trying to create new possibilities create for strategy? Are we trying to create new products? Are we trying to make decisions faster? What are the actual actions we want to do in new ways? The second kind of question you can ask, I think, is who should be making these decisions in the first place? So many of us, I think, still assume that the decisions need to be made or should be made by people on the top of the organization. And I think there are now many, many opportunities for those decisions to be made by people not only throughout your own organization, but possibly outside your organization, customers, suppliers, etc. One way of thinking about this, if I'm talking to the CEO of this hypothetical organization, is to talk about what I call in my book, the paradox of power. The paradox of power says, sometimes the best way to gain power is to give it away. Linus Torvalds, for instance, the developer of the Linux open source operating system, gave power away to thousands of programmers all over the world, but was rewarded with a different kind of power. People have heard about these new kinds of collective intelligence, things like Google and Wikipedia and Innocentive and so forth. But there aren't yet very many companies who are really taking advantage of these new possibilities. I think one reason for that is that people hear about these collective intelligence examples, they sound cool, but it seems like some sort of big amorphous mass of cool things that people don't quite know how to think about for something, as something they could actually do. What we're trying to do in this article is give you a much more sort of step-by-step -step toolbox of the pieces that are in these famous examples of collective intelligence. We call these pieces genes. They're essentially the design patterns that have been used in a certain way in these cases, but we believe can be recombined in many other ways to create very interesting new ways of using collective intelligence in lots more companies than have done so so far. But let me give you an idea about the ways we think about identifying these different genes for collective intelligence. We start by saying any activity needs to have genes to answer four key questions. What is being done? Who is doing it? Why are they doing it? And how are they doing it? For instance, in the category of how, two of the subtypes of genes we identify are collections and then an even more specialized kind of collection called contest. So a collection just means a lot of people create a lot of different things independently. For instance, YouTube is an example of a collection where many people independently create their videos and put them up on the YouTube website. But a specialized kind of collection, the one we call contest, is illustrated by Innocentive. 
where they let companies outsource difficult research problems or research questions to get answers from anyone who wants to contribute in a global pool of over 200,000 scientists and technologists around the world. In that case, a collection is also created, that is, for each company's problem, a collection of possible solutions to that problem are created. But here, the company that has the problem really only wants one or two solutions, so they select from among the collection of solutions people sent in the one or two that they want to reward with prizes that often are as much as $100,000 or so, and that they then get the intellectual property rights to use. A lot of people have heard stories about collective intelligence examples, and they think, well, that's the end of the story. But I don't think these early examples are the end of the story. I think they're just barely the beginning. And I think we'll see far more examples of many, many new kinds of collective intelligence, mixing people, computers, and the widespread communication enabled by things like the internet. I think we'll see more and more examples of those throughout business in the coming decades.